Hi, it's Rob Moore here. Welcome to the Money Podcast. How to value your time, your worth, uh, increase your revenue through higher net worth and self-worth and putting an hourly rate and choosing the things that give you the best return in your life. Also, stay with me because at the end of this live new Money Audio podcast and video, I'm going to be giving away some great gifts and bonuses for the launch of the new podcast, Money. Okay, so how to value your time. The first thing you need to realise is that you have more worth than you think you have, assuming that you're not a narcissist. Uh, And by that I mean, you know, it's not just the one or three or five years you've been in business in the thing that you're in. It's your whole life you have dedicated to becoming who you are now to give the gifts in the form of products, services and inspiration that you do right now. And it reminds me of a very famous story which I put in my book Life Leverage about Picasso. So Picasso was one of the very few artists that made a huge amount of money in his life rather than posthumously. Uh, And it was reputed that he was in a cafe and he got recognised, he was quite famous at the time. He was sitting having his uh, espresso <laughs> uh, and a lady came up to him and went, oh, you are Picasso, you are famous, wee oui, wee. Oui. Uh, and she asked, I won't do the accent anymore, and she asked him to do a sketch and he had a napkin and a pen and um, paper, whatever, quill, I don't know, back at the time. And he did this quick sketch, five seconds, signed it, gave it to her. And then there was this awkward pause, you know, that pause, oh, is this free or is this, is it, oh, do I have to pay for this? And after this pause, she said, well, how much? And he went, 5,000 francs, 5,000 francs. And she went, what, 5,000 francs? That only took you a few seconds. And he went, no, 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 no. That took me my whole life. Uh, And um, this is the thing. Um, People don't value what they've done their whole life in their work. You know, the experience you have growing up, the uniqueness of your own personality and experiences. You know, you did stuff at school, at university, everything you've read and, you know, the the contacts, the mentors, the support network, the people you've met. All of this must go into your pricing. It must go into valuing your time. Now, the only reason someone wouldn't put a high but fair exchange value on, the, on, his time, on their time uh, is because they don't add all that value in and they don't feel they're worth enough. Now, sorry, I've just been put off and trolled by Pete, who uh, thought I was doing a Spanish accent, not a French accent. So let me get back on thread. So, um, you know, your uniqueness, because you're, you're unique, we're all unique, your uniqueness is part of your value. So you have to put all of that in. Now, when you put all of that in, you increase your self-worth. When you know you're unique, you know that you, your experiences uh, and the, the unique qualities that you have and the unique journey you've gone on in your life. When, when you know that that has a value, uh, that increases your self-worth. As you increase your self-worth, you increase your, um, your hourly rate, your value, if you like. And so it becomes a virtuous cycle. Okay, so the next thing then is that you need to be very clear on your niche. Um, Because if you have this scarcity mindset or this fear of missing out that you want to serve anyone and everyone, that also means you want to serve the lower paying clients, the freebie seekers, you know, the people who want a tenner for a fiver. So if you have a fear that you won't win any business if you charge, you know, a fair and high rate, Um, You know, you'll have a lower uh, hourly rate or value and then you'll attract people who want a tenner for a fiver, the freebie seekers or just the wrong niche. Um, Then you'll reduce your prices just to keep afloat and to attract a more volume of client, even though they're the wrong client. Uh, And that will have a vicious cycle effect and that will drag your hourly rate down. Now, when you're very clear on your niche, you know, maybe if you're, for example, a business coach, um, you you might choose to have 100,000 plus turnover business owners rather than startups. Now, there's nothing wrong with a startup niche. I love the startup niche, Um, you know, but I also love the people who've got 5 million and 10 million pound a year plus niche. So when you are more clear on your target audience, you know, let's say you're a, a fashion designer. I like to wear expensive clothes. Doesn't mean I look good before you troll me, but I like to wear expensive clothes. Um, and so if, you know, if a, a jacket is less than, say, 500 pounds, I'm probably not going to be that interested in it because, you know, that, that, that I'm pretty easy to market and sell to, by the way. Um, but sometimes a higher price differentiates you. And now you shouldn't have higher price, but no quality. Of course, the quality should match. Um, but when you have a higher price, 
You don't attract the lower value clients or the lower paying clients. You attract the higher paying clients who will buy more and refer more and they will buy more and more and more and more and more. So, you know, a Richard Mille watch like this, you know, there, I think the cheapest Richard Mille is 50,000, 100,000, you know, they could be half a million pound watches. Now, of course, some people are going to be absolutely incensed how much a Richard Mille costs, but Richard Mille will attract a higher quality of client. Uh, now, of course, Richard Mille is a great watchmaker who's worked for many of the biggest and best brands and has that self-belief. Uh, and someone who buys one Richard Mille probably buys five Richard Meals or 10 Richard Meals uh, and probably um, hangs around with a load of other people who buy a load of Richard Meals. Uh, now, if Richard Meal tried to price his watches at the Casio level, then, of course, he's also competing with a much wider market and big brands like Seiko and Casio you know, have, I don't know, 100, well, maybe not 100, but, you know, decades of experience and huge marketing budgets that it's high, harder to compete with. So when you have a higher value on your time, and when I say higher value on your time, that's also, you know, i.e. your hourly rate, but it's also your pricing structure and your fee structure. When you have that, you also differentiate yourself from the competition because there's more competition at the lower end of the market. Of course, that makes sense. There's more competition at the easy jet level, um, you know, with Ryanair and, and what is it, Jet2 and all of these other brands than, you know, than it is maybe at the highest Emirates level where you have a full um, suite on your own, not just first class, but you have your own suite and room and shower and, and everything else. Um, you know, there's more competition uh, to, to buy blow up dinghies than there is super yachts. Now, look, your product or service might not be that high a niche, but I would I would encourage you to think about that, um, because if you have a commodity type product or service, you could create a higher level, you know, a, a higher brand. So, for example, Nissan, you know, they're relatively a mainstream car manufacturer, but then they have their GTR and the GTR is what? Probably about 80,000 pounds now new. Um, then they br then um, they bring out um, ver various limited edition versions. There's the Nismo GTR, which I think is 135,000. Um, you know, they make a few hundred of those or a few thousand of those. Um, you know, Nike do it with trainers. They release like a really high end model. Uh, you know, they might um, do a deal with a rapper, for example, £350 for a pair of trainers, make 6,000 of them, get everyone in the media excited about them, sell them out. And then you bring all the customers in and they trickle down and, and buy your lower value products. Audemars Piguet have a, um, a brand called Concept, which are like, you know, they're £135,000 up to... Um, you know, maybe half a million pounds. Um, and, and so, you know, there's probably more profit margin in the higher value, higher end watches, but it also brings the, 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 it gives the brand elevation, which brings the customers down. So the next thing then, and let me go back to the initial point to make another point about how to value your time is, you know, you work on your self-worth. Um, you have to believe that you're enough. You have to believe that, you know, you're, you're worthy of money. You, you have to believe that the niche that you serve, you know, you, you have authority and credibility and a right to serve that niche. You have to believe in your products. You have to believe in yourself. You know, you have to um, accept the fact that you're going to get critics and trolls and still do meaningful work. You have to believe that the price that you put on it is fair exchange. Now, if you want to increase your prices, increase your value. If you increase your value into your product, you're obviously um, naturally going to need to increase your prices. The next thing then is, do you really understand what your time is worth currently? So I call this your IGV, your income generating value. Now, if you don't know what you're worth per hour of work, how can you put a value on your prices? And you, if, you know, if you're a consultant, you're you know, charging out your time or if you do projects, charging out the project. Um, uh, now, remember, I said earlier, you have to remove this fear of not having any business and have this courage to you know, price uh, more highly. Um, so I'll probably come back to that at the end of this video. Um, if you earn, say, for example, £5,000 a month and you work 50 hours a month, then that is what, £100 an hour that you're worth. So uh, in my books, Money and Life Leverage, I gave you the calculation of how to work out what your hourly rate currently is. Now, for most people, it's a lot less than they actually thought it was. Um, because, you know, yeah, you might earn five grand a month, but if you're working 280 hours a week, you know, it's not really that much, is it? Um, if you're earning 10 grand a month and you're only earning uh, working 10 hours a week, 
it's a lot more. So what you have to do is take your total income that's active and passive from all sources, not including uh, loans or gifts. And then you have to divide that by the total number of hours you work, part time, full time, not kidding yourself that you work more or you work less. So, like I said, let's say you were, well, if you earn a thousand pound a week and you work 10 hours a week, then of course you're a hundred pound an hour. If you're a thousand pound a week, but you work a hundred hours a week, you're 10 pound an hour. Now, when you know what that value is, you actually, in reality, know what you're worth per hour's worked. Not per hour's lived, but per hour's worked. Um, and so then you can outsource all the lower value tasks, the admin, the cleaning, the cooking. I've done a, another podcast on that, by the way, which has created, created quite a lot of controversy and a few trolls for me. I had to block someone. Um, don't often block someone, but you know, it feels good when you block someone, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, um, all of those lower value tasks that bring in less than your 50 pounds an hour, you have to outsource those so you can go and do your higher value tasks or the average value of your task goes up because you're, you're getting rid of the tasks that bring it down. Because if you think about this, um, you know, someone on this live feed video has just uh, said 80-20 principle, exactly. So let's say you're worth £100 an hour, you work um, 10 hours a week and you earn £1,000 just for the sake of it. You might be more, you might be less, doesn't really matter. Now, if you earn on average £100 an hour, that doesn't actually mean every hour is £100. What that means is some hours are £10, and some hours are a thousand pounds. So I'll give you an example. If you're a property investor, viewings, offers, raising finance, and then sort of managing your property portfolio, they are all high value tasks. They would probably be in excess of a hundred pounds an hour. Uh, dealing with boilers, um, tenant issues, managing your letting agent, you know, et cetera, insurances, those are all much lower value tasks. They might only be worth 10 pounds, seven pounds, 12 pounds an hour. So the more viewings you can do, which means you can make more offers, which means you can own property, which double in value every 10 years and make you net maybe 200 pound a month passive income growing, you know, at five, six, seven percent a year. The more time you can put into there, which are the 10,000 pound an hour tasks, some of them and 500 pound an hour tasks, some of them, the more your average value goes up, which means you're valuing your time more, which means your self-worth increases because your net worth increases and it becomes this virtual, uh, virtuous cycle, if you like. The next thing you have to do is stop comparing yourself to others. A lot of people say to me, oh, well, Rob, I'm in a very commoditized business. You know, in my niche, in my business, you can't charge more than £350 for a survey or, you know, you can't charge more than £20 for a haircut. Well, there's someone in London who cuts the hair for the Sultan of Brunei and he paid charges £5,000 a haircut and he gets his travel and expenses out to Brunei paid. So the reality is in any niche, you can create a higher product or service. Um, you, you just have to differentiate yourself. You have to attract the higher quality clients. You have to um, you know, give more um, value, more perceived value. You, you, know, you have to believe that you're worth it. Why is it that an artist can charge £500 for a meter by meter canvas? And Damien Hurst can charge millions of pounds for a dead animal. A lot of that is to do with self-worth. Now, also, it's all to, also to do with your net work. So, like, people say that your net worth is your net work. I would say it's a triangle, a triad. You've got self-worth, net worth, and net work at the corner of each triangle. Um, and in the middle, you've got your wealth. So, if you have a network of wealthy people and a high net worth, sorry, you have a high value, a high network value, I'll get there in the end, uh, you have a high self-worth, then you'll likely have a high net worth. Uh, because, you know, look, if you could charge two million pounds for a dead animal, five million pounds for a dead animal, and you know billionaires, it's going to be easier to sell that dead animal. If you charge um, two, five million pounds for a dead animal, and you know people who are 50 grand in debt, they're never going to pay that much for a dead animal. So, but also, if you don't have the self-worth to charge two to five to 10 million pound for a dead animal, then of course you're not gonna increase your net worth. So, so I would say self-worth plus net work equals net worth. And like I said, they are all interlinked and then in the middle you have sustainable 
wealth. So you want to make sure that you're growing your network. You are meeting wealthy, affluent people, clients. You're getting referrals and recommendations from wealthy and affluent people and clients. You, hang, you have good business coaches, good mentors who can increase your um, confidence, which increases your worth. Uh, I very much, when people work with me, challenge people to increase their prices dramatically. There's a good friend of mine, Derek Pape, who's you know, been a client of mine for many years, and he sources property deals. And he used to sell property deals for £750 in Hartlepool. And his excuse was, well, no one in the north will pay more than that. And I thought, I thought you know what, that's your belief. OK, I don't live in the north. Um, but 750 quid for all the work you do, it's not worth it, Derek. So I said, double it immediately. Uh, and thankfully, he held his disbelief and doubled it. And then once he doubled it to 1500, I said, now you've done that. Uh, do you now realise that you can charge that? And he said, yes. Have you attracted a better quality of client? He said, yes. Are they sort of less demanding of you? He said, yes. Are they more grateful? He said, yes. I said, good. Would you like more of that? He said, yes. I said, good. Double it again. So then he doubled it to 3,000 and he didn't lose any business. Uh, there's one of our courses that we've put up 300 pounds and the conversion, i.e. we're selling, uh, the amount we're selling of these courses is more and you often attract a higher quality of client who isn't as demanding, doesn't need as much because they're not desperate as much, etc. Um, and so it continues. Now, like, I just want to say um, that this is not looking your nose down at you know, a more commodity based business. There's always room for an easy jet, just like, the, like there is a high class Emirates, an upper class Virgin. I'm just asking you, where do you want to be? Um, because, you know, I would prefer to have slightly less clients, but much higher value per client, which means much more recommendations, which means less overhead because likely less complaints because they're more grateful because they have less desperation uh, and need. Um, now, Paul has said in a price driven industry, it may be harder. And now Paul knows I like to have a little bit of interaction with him and him to challenge me and me to challenge him. Then you have to change your industry or you have to get out of your industry. Now, look, if you're in a price driven industry and you're happy with that because you're one of the dominant players, because, you know, there are price driven markets, which normally, you know, when you compete for price, uh, you have to increase the volume to win. Um, but, you know, price wars can be really damaging for companies. So you either have to own the market in a price driven um, industry. But a price driven industry is a perception, not a reality, uh, because in, I think if you look at most niches, you can say, oh, well, it's a price driven industry. You know, you can't charge more than X. Um, but then there's a company that comes and disrupts that, you know, like who, vacuum cleaners were very much like that. What, two decades, three decades ago, people bought a vacuum cleaner just to uh, just to vacuum, you know, me messy, dusty carpets. That's all it was. Now it's a fashion accessory and Dyson has got you paying 500 quid for one. And the more expensive they are, the smaller they are. It's, you know, it's kind of like Steve, do you remember when you used to get a contract on a phone? And if you signed up for a two year contract or even a one year contract, you could get a free top of the range Nokia or Motorola. So the value was not in the phone. The value was in the contract. And now Apple have got you paying twelve hundred quid for a phone. And I've, I see people with iPhones, you know, the iPhone X's who tell me they can't afford anything. I know someone who can't afford one of our courses just bought a brand new car, like a 60 grand car. Um, you know, I know some uh, people who say they can't afford anything to live, but they're, they're going to, you know, all these different countries around the world doing all these holidays and these courses and everything else. So the reality is um, you, it, you don't have to be price driven in a price driven industry. In fact, I would challenge you to disrupt that industry. I would challenge you to go not on price, but look at what the problems uh, the frustrations and the frictions are in the industry for your clients. Solve that, create new, higher level, less price based products and services. I'm not saying it's easy. I am saying it's worth it. And by the way, when your customers tell you they can't afford it, they're lying most of the time. What they mean is it's not important enough to them because there are people in debt buying £1,200 iPhones. Absolutely given. So, uh, Paul, absolutely, we're going to be working together. So um, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm going to challenge you on this. Otherwise, what's the point in hiring me if, you, if, if I don't challenge you? Uh, but also, I'll do my best to help you. Now, I want to make a, a, a caveat. I don't know every niche in the world. I'm not an expert in every niche. And, you know, there might be some niches where this is more difficult than others. Um, but, you know, if you, there, there are a lot of older, if you, like trainers, sneakers. Um, they used to be commodities. You know, trainers used to be work, functional work boots. And now Nike and Adidas are basically, you know, charging hundreds of pounds 
for fashion accessories. And there are collectors who buy hundreds or thousands of these trainers. And there are all these endorsements with these sports stars. Endorsements with sports stars and limited editions. You know, they all change the game. Um, you want to be make sure, make sure that you're selling on the human needs, whether that's, you know, lust or, you know, importance, you know, those kind of things like that. All right, so I could go on and on and on about this, um, but thank you for staying with me. Remember, I said if you stay with me, um, then I've got something special for you. So here it is. Uh, I have just launched my brand new podcast, Money. Now, I wasn't planning to tell anyone about this until tomorrow, so stay with me and you can get it before everyone else. So if you subscribe to my new podcast, Money, on iTunes or Stitcher right now, the first 250 who prove um, their subscription, we will book you onto our brand new Make, Manage and Master Money event. We've got brand new speakers. We've got five multimillionaires. I've got one of the dragons as a keynote speaker as well. This is not the same as our other money events. It's a brand new event. That has to be first 250 only though, because we can only fit 250 in our um, bigger room in our training academy. Also, you'll go into a merit-based competition to win three bundles of £1,000 cash and an iWatch and an iPad. So simply subscribe to my podcast, to disrupt, uh, sorry, money, <laughs> look at me, it's in my brain. Subscribe to my new podcast, Money, on iTunes or Stitcher. Just search Rob More Money on iTunes or Stitcher. Uh, and if you're quick enough, you'll get one of those two tickets. Now, our, our previous Money events, I've sold the tickets at 495 um, for a pair for two days. So for the first 250 of you, you're going to get it for free. Then I'm going to be charging 495 in future um, events. This is a one-off, this event. Um, and um, yeah, I like giving away cash and I like giving away Apple products because I like incentivizing you to go and get good information. I like creating a bit of a frenzy. I like doing this to help me get up to the top of the ranking so I get benefit too. So go do that right now on Stitcher or iTunes, Rob More Money. And um, by the way, we've got, what, six episodes live and another 10 episodes pre-recorded. This will become an episode as well in the future. So thanks for following my work. I really appreciate what you do. Uh, and um, I hope that this um, podcast has been useful. Let me just summarise. Your value is based on your self-worth as, and your network as well as your net worth. Uh, don't get st uh, chasing commodities and price-based niches. Get yourself increasing your value and creating higher level products. Um, make sure that you build your network because the better your network, the more money you have in your network, the easier it is to create more expensive products that have more value because, um, you know, they will give you the feedback of what they want. You give it to them um, as you increase your net worth, your self-worth increases, but it has to come from you and you have to realize that you have the value and the uniqueness inside you right now um, such that you're worth higher fees. Thanks for tuning in.